join. And for some of you, it's, it's, it's old hat. You kind of got it already, and, and, and it's not a big deal. And for others, it'll be, uh, it'll be something different. It'll be something new. And, uh, and, I, and I'm hoping that it'll be refreshing for you as you begin to look at what it means to be a Christian in the 21st century. We're going to be introducing a series based on uh, uh, what our covenant calls the Six Affirmations. And that series is entitled, This We Believe, Affirmations of Our Faith. And today we're going to be looking at uh, what does it mean to live in the Word in the world. Um, the, the, the series, the theme, in case, uh, and you probably want to write this down if you don't know it already, the theme for this year is going to be Deeper in Christ, Guided by the Spirit. Now, why do you pick that one out, Pastor Ali? Why Deeper in Christ, Guided by the Spirit? Because I believe that one of the things that we need to do as a church, not just here at Pitt Samaritan Church, but across the country in all of our churches, is we've got to get back to the basics. We've gotten too involved in programs and all the wonderful things of ministry and activities, all the things that are going on in the world, and there are good things that we do in the church, but we've got to get back to the basics. Why do I say that? Because it's so easy to find that you're drifting. You're drifting a little bit. You don't realize it, but you're, you're drifting a little bit. And, and I know in my own life, I, I have to remind myself over and over again, it's about intentionality. You have to be intentional about this walk in Christ. If you're going to be a disciple and apprentice of Jesus Christ, it's not something that just happens by osmosis. You have to become uh, engaged in the Word of God. You have to make be intentional about your relationship with God. And so that's what this is about. We picked that scripture, 1 John 3.24, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, God in him, and by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. To go deeper in Christ by his spirit presumes that you know Christ. Because if you don't know Christ, all bets are off at this point. To go deeper in Christ means that we're, we're, we're not going to settle for just, just some, some answers off the top of our head. The video was funny with Jay Leno, but it's a fact that a lot of Americans, I forget the percentage, but there are a lot of Americans that that's, that's the typical answer. Those are the answers. Because they don't know about God. And my fear is that if we don't, if we're not careful, there will be another generation that will raise up and will not know. And you think those answers are bizarre. But thank God that in this church, there is a level of intentionality about starting now, planting the seeds in these little ones. So that when they become big ones one day, that they will have the right answers. For covenant people, and, and for those of you that don't know this, if you are a visitor here for the first time or second time and you don't know this, we are a covenant church. What does that mean? That means that we are connected to what they call the Evangelical Covenant Church. It has its roots in, in Sweden. It's a Swedish, back in 1885, a Swedish background. That, that, that's where we, we started. That church came to this country and, and, and established itself. And so you have a lot of those churches, covenant churches, Swedish covenant churches, that are no longer just Swedish churches. They are churches now that, are, that, that have involved all kinds of folks. I had the pleasure of being involved in the, in the denomination some 15 years ago or so. And it was a major eye-opener for me because I learned that they are very serious about doing church. They're very serious about one of the things that's dear to my heart, and that is the Word of God. In these six affirmations, we're going to be going through the affirmations over the next six Sundays, or well, five Sundays. 
Today we're going to do the centrality of the word and then we'll get into the new birth and then the whole mission of the church. But this is what the evangelical covenant church calls it's, it's fundamental. It's, this is its place right here. This is when you come into the evangelical covenant church, this is what we buy into as a covenant church. You might be sitting there saying, well, I didn't know we were coming to church. I thought it was just Good Samaritan Church. Yeah, we are Good Samaritan Church, a short name, but we are a covenant church. We don't have any major creeds and all that kind of stuff, but we are solid in the Word of God. And that's one of the things that was pulling me into this whole thing of the covenant church because I wanted to be in a church that, that I wanted to be in a denomination that took serious the Word of God. In fact, one of the early mantras, one of the things that the early covenanters would say was, where is it in the word? That was one of the things you heard them over say over, show us in the word. Because they were so committed to the word of God. They actually in meeting together in the little small groups, we call them small groups that Today, but early on, they were called conventicles. And then when those meetings would come together with those people, they would have readers. People that would stand up and just simply read the word of God. Why? Because it's that important to the covenant church that we have people centered in the word of God. There's a quote from the covenant book of worship, and I, I, you don't have it there, but it goes like this. Where there is no accompanying scripture study and little scripture read, sung, and prayed in weekly meetings, worship becomes anemic and starved. In our text today, we have three texts, and it's a little awkward because it's, there are three, but I want to quickly just kind of touch on, I'm not going to do a deep dive on these. In other words, I'm not going to do a major exposition of these texts because it would take far too long to do a deep dive into these texts. But I'm going to grab out of these texts some key pieces for you as we move into this place of understanding what it means to be a church that affirms the centrality of the Word of God. And the text says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We speak. We speak about centrality of the word. Because we believe that there's something about the word of God that, 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 that's, that's central to our spiritual understanding. It's central to this, uh, our faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, we, we say it's the spark. It's the spark for our faith in Jesus Christ. We're, we're, it's also the way that we, we, we understand what it means to be an authentic Christian and do life together as Christians. And so when we speak of the centrality of the word, we are declaring that it is our true source of spiritual understanding. The writer in Hebrews captures it much better than I could in Hebrews 5.14. He says, but solid food is for the mature and for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Hebrews 5.14. And then Romans, Paul writes in Romans 10.17. 10, you know this scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're declaring that it is a way in which we're able to live as authentic Christians and do life together with one another because we follow what James says when he says in James 1.22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And so what we want to do in, in de uh, desiring to be people of the book, which we profess to be, that we are people of the book, we are people that, that believe that this is the final authority for us. If you are not convinced that the Bible is the final authority for your life, you're in the wrong place. Because that's all you're going to get here. Every child, every, every child of God, every, every person of God that believes in Jesus Christ has basically said that the Bible is the final authority for my life. If it's not the Bible as the final authority for your life, then what is? I think, I think sometimes we forget that in the 21st century, in a world that, that, that's constantly coming up with different narratives, 
different stories. We don't buy into the different stories. We buy into one meta-narrative, one grand story, and that's God's story, and it's all in the Word of God. Why do we do that, Pastor Ali? Because we believe that the meta-narrative, the grand story of God's story that's revealed in the Scripture is our story. And so we, we direct our life according to the story that's been revealed to us. We don't need another narrative. You can have some great hobbies and some great studying and all this kind of stuff you can do. Nothing wrong with education and all that, but it's been proven that education alone does not cut it. Some people thought that, oh, all you have to do is if we, if we just educate enough people, we'll get rid of racism, we'll get rid of hunger, we'll get rid of homelessness. We just need to educate people. And now we become in a, we're becoming a country, a world of educated fools. Why? Because we're anemic in the Word of God. As an authentic Christian, do you have a mature understanding based on a solid faith in Jesus Christ? Do you really believe that this is the Word of God? Is the Bible the final authority for your life? Hear what the psalmist says in Psalms 19, 7 through 11. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Notice how he's talking about the word of God in all these descriptions. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord. Still talk about the same thing. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired are they than gold, even fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Is the word of God really more than gold to you? If somebody were to approach you and say, I tell you what, how much is gold these days? About $1,300 an ounce. I will give you, I will give you like $2 million worth of gold. Would you value that more than the Word of God? If you had a choice, and they say, well, all you have to do is just give up the Word of God and take the gold. Would you do it? Three million. Four million. Five million. All you have to do is just give up the word of God. Six million in gold. You have your price. What we are saying is that the word of God, it's more precious than anything this word, this world could offer us. Are you being serious, Pastor? Arnie? Yes, I am. Very serious. This is it. We speak of the centrality of the word of God. We're reminded of John's comment in 8.12. John 8.12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light, the light of life. The word of God is light to the path. Why? Because the word of God is Jesus Christ revealed. We only know about Jesus because of what God has revealed to us through his word. And so when John writes early on that the word became flesh and tabernacle pitched a tent among us, when, when, the, word became, uh, when the word became flesh, it, 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 it dwelt among us. Well, how? Because now we have direction. This is the guide right here. This is how we determine how to live life right now. The writer of Hebrews in 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division 
of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is able to do that. You want wisdom? You want discernment? You want, how, want to know, you want to know how to navigate life in these times of turmoil, political turmoil and strife? You want to know how to navigate life? Word of God. It's the Word of God. Oh, that's too simple, Pastor. It can't be that simple because if it was that simple, they wouldn't figure it out. The Word of God. It is. It is that simple. The reason that we are moping around in darkness is because you have men and women that don't know Jesus Christ. They don't have the word as the center of their life. They don't have a moral compass. They're trying to navigate life with vain philosophies and thoughts from humankind. They're trying to navigate life on their own wits. And God is saying, you have to do it. We are intended for it to be done. Because we're not worshiping this. We worship Jesus. But this points to Jesus. This is how we know who he is. Because it's the word that he's revealed to us. We speak about the centrality of the word. Paul writes in Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Jesus in, in, in John 15 uses that picture of the vine and the branches for a better understanding of what that means to let the word of Christ dwell in you. D.A. D. Carson says we commune with Jesus by abiding in his words. What does that mean we abide? Let the, let, it, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Abide in his words. It means that you take up residence in the word and it becomes your spiritual dwelling. Has the Word of God become your spiritual dwelling? Is it your go-to place for shelter? If you want to know a great, great chapter to go to for understanding the Word, and really, and I have to remind myself of this over and over again, because it, it, it's just one of those places that you, you forget, to be honest with you. Go to the 119th Psalm. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. But sometimes what I do, and I was doing it this morning, I just put it on and just let it play over and over and over and over and over and over again. Why do you do that, Pastor? Are you having an ACD? What's going on? You got some OCD issue or something? No? No. It's just that I know that I need to get it over and over and over and over and over again. When I'm busy doing stuff, I need to hear the Word of God playing over and over and over again. When I'm working on things, I'm working the checkbook, I need to hear the Word of God playing over and over and over again. Why, Pastor? Are you OCD? No, I just need to hear the Word of God because it is a light to my path. Amen. Amen. It's the way that I'm able to navigate life. It's the way marriage, how I'm able to stay married after 38 years. Karen would tell you that. <laughs> it's the word of God. Is the word of God at home among you? And are we being shaped by it daily in our lives? Paul is writing, or Luke is writing, in the book of Acts 17, Chapter 17, verse 11 and 12. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women on high standing as well as men. It's in Acts. What's going on there? Paul had preached the gospel to them. Check it out when you have a chance to go back. And do this for me, by the way, you know, with what I'm going to tell you what the Bereans were doing. After Paul preached to them, they went home and they got into the Word and they started searching to find out if those things that Paul said were true. And that's exactly what we should be doing. We should be so committed to the Word of God that you just don't take it because Pastor Ali said it, but you take it. Let me go home and let me see if that's true. 
And you search the scriptures. And that's precisely what they were doing. They were searching the scriptures. And in searching the scriptures, the text says that many of them believed. They were feeding on the scriptures. Let the word, let the word feed you daily, even as the manna fed the children of Israel. Remember that? When they were in the desert, they were in that place, and God was providing food for them daily. You and I have to get that daily manna. We have to get that daily feeding from God. If we don't get it, we're going to be, we're going to dry up. Some of us are already dried up because we haven't been feeding ourselves. I've been in churches where they say, well, well, I, I left the church because I, I, I just, they're not, I'm not being fed. <laughs> That's a sorry excuse to leave a church. And I tell you, I tell you why. I'm gonna just say it. I tell you why. If you leave a church because you think you're not being fed, something's wrong with you. It is not, is it's that the church does not feed you. You feed on Jesus Christ through his word. That's where the feeding comes. Yes, the church does instruction, that's part of it. Yes. And the pastors, according to Paul in Ephesians, said, we're equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Yes, I get it. But ultimately, it's the word of God that you're feeding yourself daily. Why? Because you are committed to this. What's feeding your soul daily? Do you crave the word, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 2, the pure spiritual milk? that you can grow up in the faith. Are you craving the word? Is there a craving for the word of God? I've got to tell you this by way of confession. I love dark chocolate. <laughs> no, no, you, you, don't, you don't hear me. <laughs> I love dark chocolate. Not any dark chocolate. It's got to be 70%. You know what I'm talking about? Right where it's just that little bit bitterness, but it's not too bitter. Yeah, it's got the sweet thing. I love dark chocolate. And they have one that's called Bark. You get it at Walgreens. It's got the little almonds in it. Put it in the freezer and let it get cool a little bit. And then about, about 30 minutes, they take it out and sit down and get into work. Bark chocolate. Oh, so good. So good. Can I crave God's word like I crave the bark chocolate? Uh -oh. When I have that same craving, that's what, that's what the writer is saying here. Crave it. Let, let Paul says, see, let, 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 it, let it dwell in you richly. Why? Because the word of God is what we need in order to make this life work. I like, I like, you, you remember the, the temptation of Jesus, I think it's recorded in Matthew, it's recorded in the Gospel, but in Matthew 4.4, 4. one of the comments that's made over and over, for those of you that don't know the story, the devil had taken Jesus up to a high place and started challenging him about, well, if you are the Son of God, then, then throw yourself down, the angels will pick you up, and, uh, and all these kind of things that the devil was throwing at him after he had fasted for 40 days. So he was in a weakened state, this is Jesus Christ, the Savior. And the devil is trying to tempt him. And his response each time when the devil comes at him is what? It's the word of God. Every single time. It is written! It is written! Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. how we make it. So, quickly, there's five straightforward methods that, that, that can help us to be formed by the Word of God. I want you to take these, write these down, and, and pray about which one is going to work for you. Not all of them will work for you. <clears throat> Meditating on the passage for five minutes in the morning and at night, we're talking about how do we affirm the Word of God? How do we get it into our lives so that it's solid in us? T 
talk about God's word with those around you. Start at home. Some of us don't even talk about the word of God at home. We just don't. We'll talk about it to everybody else, but what about at home? With your kids, with the grandkids. What about having a little game that you play where you, where you put, pull out the Bible and say, say, okay, uh, you got your Bible, you got your Bible. Okay, uh, Psalm 119, 105. And the first person that can turn to it reads it out. <laughs> what are you doing? You're playing a game, but you're challenging them early on. You do this with yourselves, even as adults. Do this. Have you ever heard of that game before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some churches do it. Where you just what you're doing is you're having fun, but you're having fun in the Word of God. You're reinforcing the Word of God over and over, so that your answers aren't like Jay Leno's people's answers. <laughs> Gather to hear God's Word corporately. Attend church. If you're not in a church, get in a church. Well, I don't like the church. Because, you know, the church has issues. There's so many sins in the church, so many sinful people, and everybody there is judgmental. But guess what? It's, there's no perfect church, and guess what? When you show up, it really won't be perfect. <laughs> I'm just saying. None of us are perfect. And that's the whole reason for Jesus Christ, because he came for broken people to heal them, to restore them, to put them back together again. One day God is going to return for his bride. The church of church is the bride of Christ. And so in the process, we're being made perfect. Meet for regular Bible study. We have Bible study. We have a brand new series getting ready to start on spiritual warfare. How many people signed up? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Daryl is leading that. Where is Daryl? I saw him a minute ago. He's leading that study. Just started. Get into a Bible study. You can't make it every Sunday. Figure out what Sundays you can. Make it and be there. Listen to the Bible during the empty periods. Like I, I do that because it works for me. It's hard for me sometimes to sit down and just... I, I can't do that. When I was younger, I could do that. So now I've got to be more creative now. And so when I, I turn on the Word, I have it on my phone. I'll be listening to it. I'll be doing stuff. It, it just, just because I wanted to constantly keep going, keep going, keep going. Because it's that important. You cannot lead a home, men. You cannot lead a home, men, if you're not in the Word of God. I'm just telling you. I'm just saying. I tried it for years. It doesn't work. You've got to be a man of prayer, a man in the Word, in order to lead a family. <clears throat> what about the women? Oh, yeah. I'm not even about the women. <laughs> you can't be a mother. You can't be a wife. You can't be a helpmate unless you are in the Word of God. You have to, both of you, you have to be committed to, the, to that this is that important. And the kids, the grandkids, they've got to see that it's important to you. If it's not important to you, it's not going to be important to them. Let me conclude with this. And, and this was so convicting for me. I, I had to share it with you because it, it's just one of those things that, that uh, I, it's like, how many people know about, know the name J.I. Packer? Okay, so J.I. Packer is a British-born Canadian. He's a, he's a Christian theologian. And uh, he served in the Anglican and the uh, Calvinist traditions. Okay, he currently serves as a Board of Governors Professor of Theology at Legion College, College in uh, British Columbia. Check this out. J.I. Packer, he's written numerous books. I remember being in seminary picking up some of his books, knowing God, and studying his books, and be having to write papers on. This man has been around deep in the Word of God. Born 19 July 22, 1926. This year, he will be 93 years old. Watch this. Now in his 90s, somebody had written an article about him. 90, now in his 90s, and coping with mac macular degeneration, I said eye disease, Hacker still reads the Bible daily with the aid of a magnifying glass. Quote, 
there are people who always use the same method. This is J.I. Packer. <coughs> but my mind has always roved, wandered with a purpose through scripture, chapter by chapter, section by section. When I've read a text in its broad context a number of times, I make notes on its themes and thrust. And I try to make the notes as tidy and memorable as possible. He says, I've tried to read the whole Bible at least once whole Bible once at least every year and I want to read the Gospels a good deal more than once a year. I do find again and again the passing, the passages come to life when I read them aloud in a way that they didn't do when I read them silently. Then I try to make sure that I can see how the book that I'm reading holds together paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, theme by theme. 92 years old, and he's so convinced that the Word of God is that important that he has a magnifying glass at 92 to read it. How many of you would take the time to get a magnifying glass to read the Word of God because it's that important to you? It would be a shame as I was reading the article. I think the Lord showed the article to me because it was in a magazine that was here at the church. I, I don't get that magazine. It was just there in my box. I pulled it up and I said, oh, J.I. Packer. And so, oh, I mean, through it, I read it. It's like, oh, magnifying glass, reading the scriptures. We got to have everything a certain way to have to be. <laughs> no. Word of God. At 92, I hope and pray to the Lord that if he keeps me around till I'm 92, that I have the wherewithal to be able to get into the Word and be it, whether with a magnifying glass or rail or whatever. But I have that desire. Do you have the same desire? Do you crave the Word of God? Is it that important to you right now? <coughs> Everything falls, lands on what you think about the Word of God. <clears throat> There's a song by Mercy Me called Word of God Speak. I like that first part of it. It says, I'm finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, it's okay. The last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say. The word of God speaks. We want God to speak to us. And if we're going to be deeper, if we're going to be deeper in our walk with God, not mediocre, not superficial, but if we're going to deepen our walk in the Lord, whether you're old, young, or in between, it has to start with the Word of God. You could be a teacher, a preacher, a reverend, or whatever your title is, a chaplain, it has to start with the Word of God. Do you have an unswerving desire and commitment to God's Word? And that's where the conviction is in my own heart because I couldn't answer it. And that's where the yes, I do. It's easier to preach it and teach it, but to say that I have that kind of commitment, I'm not there yet. I confess, I'm not there yet. And so I guess what I, what I want to do is I want to I take a minute to just, maybe, maybe you're not there either. Maybe, maybe you're where I am. Maybe you've got two, three or four Bibles sitting around gathering dust at home, and you don't pick them up. You don't even dust them off. But you want that to change in 2019. You want to go deeper. I want to invite you to come down. I want, to, I want you to pray with me, pray for me. I want to pray for you. I want you to come on down. If that's where you're at, you need to. We, we want to get serious about this. Because we cannot make it in this life without the Word of God. Bill is going to be up here too and pray, and some other, a couple others pray people. And we're going to be meeting after church today and getting more prayer and praying people, hopefully. We want to tell God, we want to say to God, God, we're all in. We're all in for going deeper in your word. 
We're tired of playing games. We don't want to just check the box off anymore and just say, yeah, I'm a Christian, because it's a nice thing to say to other people. It gives you that one up kind of attitude. We want to say, we're all in because we're serious about God's word. And let it start with us. Let it start with us. Father, thank you so much. This is a hard one, God. You pricked my own heart on this one. 